All right. So let's talk about your new book. That was fast. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Lovely. But it's a pleasure to be here and uh, good to be chatting with you again. Um, so yeah, so my uh, newest book is Meta Modernism: The Future of Theory. Um, it has a most excellent cover by the same artist who did uh, The Myth of Disenchantment, which we talked about in the show earlier. Um, it's by the same press, so that's partially that, but also they wanted um, brand continuity, they said, which is not something I like to think of, but uh, they liked that the covers are similar. Um, and it just came out, well, it came out now almost two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago from University of Chicago Press. Nice. Yeah. And last time we talked, you were working on this book, and I remember that I really want to read it. So you do have to send me one now. Okay, I will. Yeah, happily. Yeah. <laughs> I need it. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about what came, how this book came about. Yeah, so it, in a certain respects, um, deals with things that I've been grappling with ever since I started graduate school. So um, one of the things that a lot of us who experience graduate school in the humanities and social sciences, basically from the early 2000s, at least uh, down to the present, um, and probably you know beginning in the 90s or something, was often an encounter with a body of theories we could call postmodernism. And th these, this was sort of a set of uh, different theorists who never exactly clicked together, didn't think of themselves as part of a movement, but were often anthologized together. So a little snippet of Derrida, a little snippet of Foucault, a little Heidegger or Nietzsche or whoever, kind of shake it up together. And then that function, that kind of postmodernism in a very academic way, um, irrespective of what was happening in the arts or, or culture as a whole, functioned as a kind of guiding model for many scholars in the humanities and social sciences for most of, um, you know, starting basically in the 90s and then continuing until about a decade ago when the high watermark uh, of postmodernism has already been hit. And then um, as it fades away, the kind of question becomes um, what could come next or what should come next? Um, and for me, there were a lot of people who were criticizing postmodernism without recognizing what were, to my mind, the good bits about postmodernism. Um, and on the other hand, uh, I think the good bits were delivering diminishing returns. So I both wanted to move past postmodernism, but also to recognize the things that we might want to hold on to moving forward. And so I wrote this book, which is really weird in a way because it's systematic philosophy. And uh, when I used to first started presenting on this, um, on material that was in this book about a decade ago, um, I like the very first presentation, I, I was like, I have a confession to make, I have a system. And it felt a little bit like AA because, um, not that I've actually personally been to AA, but, I, AA, but as I imagine it goes, because it was such a kind of public um, sense for, for a lot of people that it was weird that systems were not a good thing, that a will to system was uh, meant a loss of kind of integrity or a kind of intellectual imperialism or, or something like that. But for me, what I realized was that things like our attitudes toward language, toward knowledge, toward ethics, um, toward the things that make up the social world were all interwoven. And so if you wanted to be at least even a little bit minimally consistent about it, your attitude about one area has an impact in another area. If you think culture is, you know, or, or society is formulated in some way, that's going to affect how you interpret language. Or depending on what you think meaning is, there may be questions about how you know that meaning is X, Y, or Z. And so these this complex set of in, intertwined things, I try to sort of pull up and knit together. Um, and I got to them in part by working through postmodernism and consolidating its best insights. But really what I'm arguing uh, is first order philosophy. So it doesn't need the steps I took to get there. They're just the steps, you know, intellectual um, history to, to, to get me there. Um, and then what I articulated was a kind of a fresh way of working through some problems in epistemology and meaning uh, and in ethics. And then um, I sent this to my publisher without this title. It just had, it said, absolute disruption, the future of theory. And, you know, they were like, well, it's way too long. And like, what ism is it part of? Like, what camp of philosophy uh, do you belong to? And I was like, I don't really like camps in philosophy. Uh, I think if you put an ism on something, it tends to make people skeptical of it. But I thought they really wanted one. And and, and when and peer reviewers, I went out for peer review, and the peer reviewers referred to it as post-postmodernism, which made me want to throw up because that's just even worse than the word postmodernism. It's post-postmodernism. What a non, uh, you know, a, a terrible uh, coinage. And so um, I 
remembered something that I had read by a Nigerian art historian named Moyo Okadiji, who was describing, he wrote, um, he contributed to a book about um, African and Jewish diasporic art, which I was reading uh, as part of a, preparing a, a course um, on diaspora, and um, which I didn't end up teaching for various uh, institutional reasons, but was kind of fun to, to prepare. And um, when I thought about it, I, he had referred to this attempt by diasporic artists to transcend, work through, move past modernism and postmodernism alike with the expression metamodernism, which for him was a kind of decolonial term, uh, a term for standing both, you know, uh, with complex entanglements with modernism and postmodernism, but also representing a kind of diasporic experience. And I thought, you know, that's what I'm trying to do with my philosophy. So, um, in that kind of light way, I, I started using the term metamodernism, but it's not one. There's some folks who've used that term else, uh, otherwise uh, after Moyo's original usage in the 80s, but um, my work doesn't connect with them super much. I read some of them after I'd already taken that term as a title and then you know wanted to do, do justice to other people who've used that term, but they're not a lot. So it often off, off puts people when I say, you know, metamodernism in the future of theory, they're like, what's metamodernism? I'm like, ah, for my purposes, it's something I've kind of made up, but what I want it to be uh, is a paradigm for doing kind of scholarship um, in the academy and maybe even outside the academy, uh, you know, uh, in the era after postmodernism loses its dominance. Uh, so that's kind of what I thought the project was, or that's what that kind of is. And then it has different pieces, basically. Yeah. What kind of different pieces? Great. Um, so <laughs> the book has basically um, uh, has four parts, basically, to it. I think that's right. I've not been talking about it enough, but I almost don't necessarily part it. But yeah, four parts. That's probably better to talk about in parts rather than chapters. Uh, the first part uh, is an intervention into this conversation about what we, when people mean when they say, when they talk about realism or anti-realism or when they say um, something is real or not real. And what uh, what I came to by doing scholarship, um, historical scholarship, but also scholarship in topics like, you know, Western esotericism or Asian religion uh, or what have you, uh, is that uh, a lot of the vocabulary that scholars were using for realism or anti-realism were too blunt instruments. People were mostly talking past each other. Um, and the the notion of what it meant to be real or not real was often presumed rather than discussed. And so one of the insights of the book was this notion that um, when folks use the term real, it's a contrastive term, which is gaining it ma majority of its meaning usually from an implied contrast that's not being stated. So for instance, if I tell you um, that I, I use an, that that this is um, you know a, a real uh, statue of Su Wu Kong, or if I tell you this is a real statue, I might be meaning that it's real as opposed to uh, something that I've dreamed, or as opposed to something that's an imitation statue, or it might be um, you know a, a real Su Wu Kong, which might mean a real Monkey King, uh, or it might be a, you know or not or whatever. But there are many different contrastive terms that may not have been the best example, but there are many contrastive terms uh, that are implied when you say something is real. So, for instance, um, another example might be um, if I say that's a real picture of Elvis. I might mean that it's a picture of Elvis Presley, or it's a real picture of a different Elvis, or it's a real photograph rather than something generated by chat GPT, or it's a photograph as opposed to a painting. All of those uh, implied contrasts, some kind of not way of being real, are, are not being specified when you merely use the term real. So one of the things that the book argues for is a kind of meta stance toward the notion of realism, which is to say, um, we just have to be much better at specifying what we mean when we talk about real and not real. And then the other piece is that for many folks, what uh, many scholars are talking about things in terms of realism or non-realism, the contrastive term is mind dependent or socially constructed. So to say something is real seems to mean to some folks that it's not socially constructed. And then I started to think about like how many different ways could something be socially constructed or mind dependent? And it turns out a lot of those uh, are actually physical objects. So, you know, a book is socially constructed or uh, a gun is socially constructed, but it still kills you if it shoots you. So it seems that that pure contrast between real um, 
and socially constructed isn't sophisticated enough. To say that, for example, race is socially constructed could be mistaken as the view uh, that people don't experience racism, which is not what anyone would want to say. Um, uh, on the other hand, to say race is real could be a claim about biological categories, and I don't think race is a meaningful biological category, but instead we could say more sophisticatedly, you know, social construction is how it comes to be experienced or comes to be realized, uh, and then we can start to get more sophisticated about how things are put together uh, in the social world. So um, that's part one of the book. Uh, I know it's kind of like it's this book more so than my previous two books, which were both history. This one is more, you know, like in your face philosophy. Um, I know that'll appeal to a different set of readers, but I do think that the word real just gets thrown around and, and concepts like socially constructed. It seems like people think that they know what they mean when they say something is socially constructed and imply that it isn't real. But um, anyway, I go through a whole typology that I think can clarify those conversations um, and can think about how then social categories or social kinds are then realized or brought into being, uh, not just by humans, but by other kinds of social animals, like how are, um, uh, how are ant hives uh, brought into existence as social kinds, how, are, um, how do wolf packs determine their leadership, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of those are kinds of things that we might want to think about how they are socially constructed. Um, and then I you know, provide a theory about how that works and how that fits together. Um, yeah. Interesting. No, it's mm. definitely a false dichotomy that people throw around all the time. Yeah, totally. And one of the things that I'm trying to, I'm committed to is overcoming um, yeah, those kind of false dichotomies. And I think that the real anti-real one or real so versus socially constructed one is particularly unhelpful and incredibly widespread and not just in everyday conversation. Um, you know, I hear to my, my students saying it and I see my colleagues saying it and I um, and it trickles out into the mainstream culture, at least to some extent. Um, and so partially I wanted to kind of work through that and get more sophisticated. And then the bulk of the book, um, kind of part two, which is the, the majority of chapters um, is an attempt to think a kind of what we could call a social ontology to de-jargonize that. It's an attempt to figure out how things become socially made real or brought into existence, uh, taking, trying to pursue it from a non-anthropocentric perspective. So what if you stop thinking about um, humans is the only kind of social animal, but you recognize that, um, you know, it, uh, that at the very least, um, there's a whole range of different species with varying degrees of sociality from species that never encounter each other except to reproduce to species that form intense eusocial communities like insect hives or beehives or something like that. Um, Although my attempt to articulate it was primarily for the benefit of scholars in the humanities and social sciences, I then start to work this out in kind of some detail. And in doing so, um, I try and grant a lot of the insights that I argue motivated um, what folks think of as postmodernism in the first place. Um, and so uh, in a set of uh, chapters, I teach, teach a reader, uh, let's say an ideal uh, reader, how to deconstruct a set of social categories, uh, showing how they fall apart. I, I have provided a kind of, um, anarchist cookbook for subversive street epistemology. So to let you knock down any social category you want and show the ways that it cr collapses or crumbles. Um, and then uh, tools to kind of put back together an understanding of social categories or to see how they're built in the first place uh, so that you could co creatively create new social categories or you could track the way social categories unfold or transform in time. Um, and I call these kind of social categories with a placeholder term social kinds. And then I try and make an argument for how scholars in humanities social sciences, but also ordinary folk might want to think about social kinds going forward. Um, and you know what that term could mean and what we could do with it and what it would look like to kind of um, develop a new attitude where we can recognize both the um, our capacity to you know deconstruct them but also uh, the way that they can they're realized and therefore present themselves as kind of entities with their own autonomy or categories with their own autonomy that can seem universal, that can seem natural uh, in some abstract sense. Um, and then, um, yeah, how they might be studied and transformed. Um, there's a lot of chapters there. It's kind of the densest part of the book. Um, but anyway, that's that's what that part two is about. Yeah. Very interesting. And then part three. And then in part three, um, I start to think about meaning, because one of the things that you would have to know uh, if you uh, are interested in how the social world is put together, um, you know, um, broadly speaking, uh, is to think about how meaning gets made. What do we mean by meaning? 
uh, and uh, um, or what might we mean by meaning? Uh, and um, in part, this section was motivated by a real frustration with um, one of the biggest um, insights, let's say, of uh, we could call it postmodernism, or in this case, more specifically, a particular linguistic philosophy associated with the linguistic turn, um, or, or often in particular post-structuralism. Um, so the writings of Saussure and others. But anyway, this is this idea that like everything is just made out of language. And uh, the idea um, that a lot of folks got from uh, a Swiss linguist named Ferdinand de Saussure was the idea, he doesn't this is sort of like second order Saussurianism, but the idea that words um, refer to concepts uh, and uh, gain their uh, meaning from each other, but they don't connect to the world. And so there's this idea that people are imprisoned in the memorable phrase used by Fred Jameson in a prison house of language. And that basically language mediates all our interaction with the world, that we're trapped in it, that we are only capable of perceiving by way of language um, and that um, different languages uh, more or less determine our experience of the world. And so some of this um, you know, connects back to other theorists who, 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 whose names I could, you know, are probably not that interesting to your readers, but or listeners uh, or viewers, I guess. Um, but um, that philosophy of language had some important insights. And I do think that uh, I wanted, to, you know, I would grant that the languages that you use, um, and I think there's good evidence for this, may shape uh, or have impact on the ways that you think, uh, you know, rhetoric is important, uh, describing things in different ways might shape how you see them, um, different categories, uh, different languages, for instance, have different color terms, and if your language has a color term, it's easier for you to remember that color term, or what have you, um, but um, I wanted to argue that um, language had to evolve from somewhere, and I had a kind of memorable experience um, out in hiking in a forest in Japan, an encounter with a snow monkey, uh, where it was trying to communicate, probably not to me, but to other snow monkeys that were around it, and I started thinking about how the snow monkey, without the mediation of human linguistic forms, um, might perceive its environment and how language might evolve in the first place, um, and what I ended up arguing for uh, is um, I teamed up here in conversation with my brother, who's an animal studies dude, uh, and um, 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 we, you know, talked about this stuff for years, and we ended up articulating something that we call hylosemiotics, which is again. I only use jargon when I absolutely need to, but I needed a shorthand for this orientation toward language. And hylon means matter or forest, and semiotics uh, means a system of meaning or signs. And I wanted to argue, or I argue, I. I kind of came to the idea, or I think this is true, that um, that let me explain what I think we mean by meaning. I think so uh, the ordinary English expression, um, for instance, um, uh, smoke means fire, uh, tells us something significant about meaning and the way that we perceive our environment. Uh, we tend to perceive our environment in terms of signs, and the signs are uh, could be anything. It could be uh, they could include things in nature. The the smoke, for instance, isn't something that someone necessarily consciously produced, but when you see smoke, you might see that it means fire. So this first insight is, um, I, I begin to develop and think more about in complicated ways. Other folks have had bits of this before, but I, you know, I would argue that um, uh, there's a, for instance, a Baltic German biologist named uh, Jakob von Uxkull, who um, described the way that animals perceive the world in terms of carriers of meaning that are significant to them. So uh, the tick, uh, senses kind of boric acid in the sweat to see if it's going to land on you. Uh, I'm thinking of that because I there are a bunch of ticks out here and my daughter had one on her the other day and I was like, oh no, ticks. But anyway, it's that scent of smell of your skin that the tick is drawn to. That's semantic, that's meaningful to the tick, but it's not meaningful to us humans insofar as we can't really detect that smell. So anyway, so I end up arguing that, um, to fast forward a little bit, that um, Meaning comes that there are two aspects to meaning, that there's a disconnect between voluntary, between sign production and sign consumption. So we're capable of uh, voluntarily producing certain kinds of signs, like the words that I'm saying. Those signs uh, are in some sense, um, you know, conscious products, uh, but also uh, we communicate more than we necessarily intend to. So we, uh, for instance, uh, you can tell from my accent that I come from the United States, uh, and I may not be intending to communicate that, but a sign consumer could consume that and interpret both the words that I'm saying and my accent, I don't know, and uh, things about my social class or, you know, um, whatever, you know, a lot of things are, are, are one can infer. So in that respect, um, what you're capable of consuming in terms of signs is different than um, what you or any given sign producer is intentionally producing. And then I, you know, think a little bit about 
um, different kinds of sun consumption. Um, and I end up arguing that um, not only do is it, it turns out to be the case that different people therefore can um, get different kinds of inference or, or perceive different kinds of things from the same tree. So for, for you, you know, one of us looking out, I'm looking out over my college campus below, might see uh, the oak tree out there and might note from the position of its leaves, uh, might be able to accurately note that that position of their leaves means it's going to rain, for instance. Uh, whereas me, I don't know what position of leaves of trees do anything. I'm not even totally sure that's an oak tree, uh, <laughs> but I can infer, uh, you know, that there's a tree over there or something like that, right? So rather than thinking of meaning as um, a part of natural information that's built into the environment or something that is merely arbitrarily uh, a kind of linguistic prison that locks us outside of the environment, I wanted to talk about the way in which the world itself produces signs constantly and that sentient beings or sign consumers are capable of interpreting them in a variety of different ways. And of course, languages are part of the things that we might uh, think of as particularly human mechanisms for the interpretation and manipulation of signs. But even us, we're not fully um, trapped in the particular uh, linguistic categories of our um, native language or or what have you. So um, yeah. So anyway, so that's that's the that's part three of the book. And yeah. So I'm like, should I hear about four four or jump in? Because it's really interesting. It's interesting that your brother works with animals because you have had this kind of thread of different, like the social animals and these different kind of ways animals organize themselves throughout the book, the way you've been describing it. Yeah, totally. And I think that was one of the big insights for me was looking at you know, uh, literature in uh, in animal behavior studies, in um, looking at literature also in critical animal studies, which looks about how animals are described or how, you know, people, um, different groups get um, uh, uh, described as not human. And, you know, there's all sorts of messy stuff around the very category of the animal other um, that I think was also interesting to think about. Um, but I thought most useful ended up doing, you know, doing this reading I did on um, animal social categories, animal behavior, animal cognition, all of this stuff, I wasn't exposed to at all as, uh, you know, even though I did uh, as an undergraduate, um, I, I started off thinking I might do pre-med. And so I did the human, you know, the I did a plant bio, human biology, neuroscience um, set of courses. But even in those courses, you were getting like the autonomy, autonomy of the human body or the human brain, but almost no reference um, you know, beyond, you know, biology 101 to, to animals and to our, even our closestly related species. Um, and so in conversation with my brother really pushed me into a whole different body of literature that I found really provocative when I was trying to think through both meaning and how, for lack of a better word, so societies are put together or the social world is put together. Um, and, you know, I think that the other insight from that too is that if you were um, going to study humans the way that we study ants, or something like that, then you it causes us to foreground different aspects of the social environment. So um, sociologists historically, you know, like Emil Durkheim or something, writing about the social tended to imagine kind of social facts uh, and the society as an organic whole that somehow perhaps floats outside of the individual. Um, you know, we're somehow in society. It's a kind of medium, the metaphor is that we move wish, but it's not visible to us. But if you were looking at an ant society, you would be struck by the way that, or, or like an insect hive or something, you would be struck by the materialization of the society, the way that the material structure of the hive, uh, that the material structure of the, I don't know, um, uh, uh, of the way that the branch has been modified by the wasps or whatever, all of that is part of um, what it means to build a social structure. And so for humans, uh, our social world is also built in materialized objects. So it's the things, you know, it's the environments that we live in, it's the books that we produce, or, you know, even more basically, it's our tools, uh, it's our, and, you know, and, and it's, um, and producing social kinds isn't just making pronounced pronouncements about them, like a very famous social theorist named John Cyril argued, he thought it was, you know, you make, anyway, he had a theory, it has to do with lang linguistic speech acts. Um, but, you know, you don't use a linguistic speech act necessarily to make a bottle, you know, you make it. Uh, and um, and so we have transformed that environment, our environment, and in so doing, transformed ourselves. And so then the line between, uh, there, there are complex ways in which social categories affect biological categories, for instance, and, you know, all those kinds of things that, that then problematize 
the clean lines between the social and the material in ways that make you think that the social is not real or something like that. And so um, it turned out that then looking to animal species, uh, a different kinds of social animals really helped think through both uh, social organizations and um, language and perception. Um, so, and again, that's something, you know, uh, outside of my original training, it was a, it was a hoot to read through uh, this material. And it was good that I had my brother to talk to about stuff when I was like, what's going on here? Or who should I read? Or uh, what have you. Um, my brother's professionally now a librarian. Uh, he did his PhD, but he didn't land a tenure track job. But that even uh, uh, superficially, uh, selfishly benefited from a lot because I could say, recommend books to me, you know, recommend things to me. And he was uh, super spot on about that. And and so um, anyway, incredibly useful uh, and valuable to me and just really pleasurable to be able to talk about these intellectual things with him, even though we don't always agree. I mean, and so, um, you know, we end up in some different places, but uh, uh, but I think with overlap. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. You have to invite him on the podcast too then. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That'd be fun. More about that, because it also yeah. moves away from this idea of humans as being this like exceptional, you know, creature that's above the earth because we're so spiritual and transcendent or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And and that's, you know, definitely part of the motivation here, too. I think that there's this there was this presupposition and you and you read it in a lot of broadly speaking, postmodernist philosophers, for instance, but there are obviously way earlier, quote unquote, modernist antecedents that suggest that humans are unique creatures, uh, that we're like, it's us over and against nature, or, you know, humans dominating nature in an older metaphor, or humans in a, uh, is uniquely imprisoned or exiled from nature, a fallen metaphor. Um, and I think neither of those is necessarily the case. And, and what's more, I mean, isn't, is the case at all. And, and what's more, um, I think, you know, given the importance of things like um, anthropogenic climate change and uh, sustainability issues, our older, uh, for you know, anthropocentric models, we're, we're at the very least not helping us. And we're actively probably standing in the way in many cases from um, recognizing the, the way that we're intermeshed with nature. We're, as species, uh, you know, Homo sapiens have been, have evolved in relationship to a specific natural world and alongside and uh, other kinds of, for lack of a better expression, companion species, for instance. So, you know, um, evolving alongside cows has, for instance, changed uh, the provided genes um, so that such that many people can consume uh, milk products. I'm lactose intolerant, so it's not me, but uh, I didn't same. get that gene. Oh, same. <laughs> so neither of us. But, you know, uh, there are people who uh, who have evolved lactose tolerance. Um, so, you know, um, you know, for instance, just as one example of the way that our uh, interspecies um, nature has changed us and changed other creatures. So, um, you know, that kind of thing. So I wanted to think about it in that more holistic sense. And um, yeah, so those both two parts of the book are significantly invested in uh, thinking about social categories in that way and meaning in a, in a broader pan species kind of way. Yeah. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, and I have a friend named Patricia McCormick who I'll have to invite on here too, because I haven't had her on yet either. So many people to talk to. Um, but she once said that I just loved this when I saw her give a presentation. She's very like vegan and, and you know, environmentally conscious and things. And uh, she was talking about people's fantasies of like alien abduction and things like that. Mm. And how all these like fantasies are actually things that we do to the animals, like probing them and cutting them open and all this stuff. And I, I had never thought about it that way. It was like, wow, we have like nightmare fantasies about mm -hmm. the way that we treat, about being treated the way that we treat other creatures. Yeah, totally. That's really telling. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so what's part four of the book? Yeah, so part four, and, and now I'm recognizing that, the, yeah, so part four is, um, has two subparts, it's kind of split in half. Um, and part, the first part of part four uh, is about knowledge. And so one of the reasons that I think um, postmodernism became so dominant was as a particular form of skepticism. And this skepticism wasn't necessarily found in the originary postmodern thinkers fully, but when you interweave them together, they became a kind of interlocking series of actually incompatible, but seemingly uh, insurmountable skepticism. Skepticism about the capacity to have any knowledge in general, or the idea that all knowledge is power, or the idea that um, any phrase can be deconstructed, or the idea that, um, you know, um, all, all sorts of many different ways of uh, arguing that you can't really know anything and it's probably a bad idea to even claim or try to do so. And 
um, this kind of skepticism had already, uh, it was weird. I mean, when people adopted it, they thought it was politically emancipatory. And, you know, when postmodernism came particularly to, to, to huge prominence in the 80s and 90s, but particularly the 80s and post-Thatcherite uh, Britain and in Reaganite um, United States, you can see why, you know, there were people wanted kinds of skepticism that they could mobilize. Um, and there were some good things about that. But uh, it's become the case that that, you know, postmodernism, you know, leaped from left to, to right um, uh, after a certain point. And so you've got this widespread idea, not on merely one part of the political spectrum, but uh, more generally that um, knowledge was impossible and that or that, you know, you were just stating opinions, uh, alternate facts or, you know, what sometimes gets called post-truth, although it wasn't, uh, although it more likely it was a skepticism about knowledge more broadly. I don't know. I don't love the phrase post-truth because um, it presumes that there's a the truth that we can get back to in some simplistic way that I, I think is also a mistake. But this so this broad climate of skepticism is part of how postmodernism took dominance. And I wanted to argue that this skepticism um, was was actually leading us into a bad place, both in terms of its ori original political motivations and even as scholars, the idea that nothing can be known uh, is a is a is a difficult position. And so, in particular, or at least you know, various kinds of mobilized versions of it um, were mostly used to kind of cripple an already weak uh, intelligentsia through continual self inflicted wounds in a certain way. And so. Uh, on the other hand, I didn't think we wanted to, I think there are many, re many of the critiques were in their original formulation well-motivated. They're real forms of skepticism. And uh, folks who thought that the simple answer was to return to a, a unitary truth or, you know, to slap facts or something as if those were uncontroversial issues were doing more harm than good in their attempt to repudiate this stuff. So the idea of like, can't we just go back to facts? Uh, was, if anything, mobilizing more forms of skepticism that were corrosive uh, and making it harder for us to figure out how to be to direct our skepticism uh, appropriately. And so uh, I returned in a weird enough way uh, to, to back to the source in thinking about skepticism or one of the early sources. Uh, and I went back to the writings of Sextus Empiricus, who's not only ha does he have a fabulous name, but was an early um, a, a early skeptic, basically uh, part of the early influence um, on the notion of Pyrrhonic skepticism. We have um, so, you know, very uh, influential classical skeptic writer and, Sextus Empiricus uh, described um, the, um, the the history of thought in a particular way, or the, you know the, his moment in a particular way. He said at first there were kind of dogmatists who in, insisted uh, on certain things that they felt that they knew to be true, and those dogmatists were challenged by a group uh, he called academic skeptics. And academic skeptics said, um, you know, nothing can be known. Um, and that all knowledge is impossible. And to that, um, Sectus Empiricus wondered how they knew that all knowledge was impossible. And he argued that the true Pyrrhonic skeptic, the, the true um, kind of a continually questioning skeptic would also doubt the dogmatism of the academic skeptics. And so, um, from him, and so then I took a, a term that he uses to describe this kind of relationship. The term is zetetic; it means literally wanderer, um, but uh, uh, and or quester. Um, and what I wanted to do was uh, describe the importance of a meta-epistemic stance that is neither um, a false certainty, neither certaintism, nor a uh, uh, dogmatic skepticism, and that was capable of being skeptical of skepticism. So it turned it turned skepticism on itself. So I want to argue that you can, when someone provides you with a skeptical argument, you can either be recursive with it or you can turn it into not a dogmatism, but a caution, which would be an actual, because it turns out that a lot of the dogmatic postmodern skepticisms are not them, are themselves assertions of truths, of knowledge, not doubts, which would be the popular, pop, the proper tool of a skeptic. So if someone says knowledge is power, they're communicating to you something that they think of as a certainty. They're not asking you to question in a new way. But what we actually want to be doing is questioning. So uh, you could, we can transform that skeptical dogmatism into a proper doubt and say, you know, so we should be skeptical when knowledge and power go together, but that doesn't mean that all knowledge is power. That itself would be a dogmatic certainty, for instance. And so this meta-epistemic stance uh, towards zeteticism is a skepticism of skepticism that can lead us out toward humble knowledge, where we then tend to recognize that um, we can't know anything with certainty. Uh, and that's important because, um, you know, uh, uh, mistaken uh, aims for certainty are one of the main things that fuel different kinds of conflicts and also fuel um, 
uh, skepticisms themselves. But um, so we recognize that we may and we recognize that we might not know when we know. We can never be certain that we know things. And so I think that uh, changes our orientation toward knowledge in the world. And we tend to recognize then that our knowledge has a kind of what we might think of as a temporal horizon or a half-life to it. So that, um, you know, we know what we know without holding on to it too much because both the things that we're referring to are often in a process of change and our conceptual categories uh, are involved consistent alteration and refinement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so for those reasons, uh, a pursuer of humble knowledge, uh, I want, we might want to call a zetetic. And a zetetic, rather than being a um, dogmatist or mere fallibilist, uh, certaintist or mere fallibilist or, or dogmatic skeptic or, or of any sort, tries to have a kind of minimal set of beliefs. So uh, to be a zetetic is to recognize that there's a whole stuff that I just don't know. It's a kind of, it's closer to a agnosticism in certain respects, but also doesn't give up on the quest for knowledge as long as we know that um, we're, we have to hold on to our knowledge lightly. And I spend a good chapter talking about that and arguing for how concretely one might produce new knowledge uh, in, in a, a zetetic way, what that knowledge would look like. Um, what it would mean to have that orientation to the world. Uh, and I argue that this is a more appropriate um, form of knowledge, both for our current moment, where there are a lot of things we might want to be skeptical of, but also for, um, you know, for both personal life and political agency. I mean, there are a lot of good reasons why neither skepticism nor uh, uh, certaintism are, are good models and why we need some kind of alternative option. And so there I push a kind of zeteticism. Um, yeah, a, yeah, a kind of open-mindedness. Um, and directedness toward humble knowledge. Um, yeah, and so I needed a new word to come up with that, and so I lifted one from Sextus Empiricus, yeah. Very interesting, and it seems especially pertinent, like you said, in this political climate, and also with the, with the internet and like deep fakes and all of the different things that uh, we're presented with. Yeah, totally, and I think like if you were to default into an old a certaintism and you know i don't know a lot of those people want to slap quote unquote scientific facts and shout at other people about them that would be a mistake but similarly it would be a mistake to just claim that there's nothing real and nothing true and uh and just to kind of blithely go ahead or just to say that it's all uh, that there's no such thing as knowledge there's only you know opinion or something like that that would be that would also not be useful um and so um uh, for, for that reason, I think a kind of emancipatory, humble knowledge, uh, which we could call zeteticism, is a probably better sort of conceptual, meta-conceptual orientation for us. Uh, and it also lets us consolidate the good suspicions of postmodernism without taking them to the level that they become either self-refuting or um, uh, a skeptical prisons. Uh, so all, all that, I think, is to the good. So that's, yeah, that's what that chapter is. And that's what I was going to ask you too. So, what do you think are the good takeaways that we should keep from postmodernism? Well, I think you know, um, in in each space, there's some things to you know. Each of the five um, or four areas that I talk about, there's something important to learn from. So, one um, in terms of the notion of of realism, uh, there was a good um, let's call it postmodernist critique of a kind of simplistic realism that presumes the universality of a set of um, you know, a particular worldview that took dominance at a particular, you know, positivist context in the 70s or 80s and has already changed a number of times. It's already, even when the postmodernists were criticizing it, um, it was already, um, you know, being challenged from, you know, positions within the scientific world, such as, you know, quantum physics, et cetera. But in any case, to, clinging too, to, 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 too to, tightly to a, to a simplistic notion of realism, uh, we need to reject. And so the postmodernists were helpful in that regard. Um, in terms uh, of um, uh, social kinds, the postmodernists were very good at showing that concepts uh, are not uh, universal, that things like uh, categories like gender can be are socially constructed, that they have particular histories to them, that they uh, many of these categories are uh, important categories are Eurocentric, that they don't behave everywhere in the same way, uh, that they have contradictions built into them, um, that they're that um, that they are often connected to systems of power and domination. All those things, um, you know, we can grant without then presuming presuming that we like somehow should or can enter a world with no categories uh, at all, or without presuming that one um, can merely change those categories by um, recognizing their historically constructed nature, although I think that's an important first step. Um, 
And then uh, also in terms of philosophy of language, I think the um, uh, linguistic turn was right that we do interpret the world in terms of meaning, we and other uh, sentient beings, but a mistake to assume that all meaning interpretation was in terms of language and a mistake to determine that, to assume that um, we were imprisoned separate from the world rather than recognizing that part of the reason that there is meaning is because there's a world around which meaning can coalesce in some way or another. Um, and so for that reason, um, you know, language shapes thought but doesn't imprison us in it. And um, and there are plenty of ways. Another thing that many postmodernists thought was, for instance, that translation was impossible. And it turns out that that's a contradictory statement. The more evidence, so not only were most of those works read in translation, but the more evidence you provide that a particular term is untranslatable, the more you have to provide more translations for it. So when Derrida was arguing that um, James Joyce's he war is not translatable into French, he provides a long translation of what that phrase means. So, um, so instead we have to recognize that translation is possible, but we recognize that there's not one-to-one -one translation. There's not simple translation. Every translation is an interpretation, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, we gain some cautions out of it, but without turning it into dogmatisms or mistaken view of language. Uh, then uh, in terms of knowledge, I talked about how we turn uh, postmodern skepticism into, into doubts rather than dogmatic certainties. And then finally, in the last part of the last chapter of the book, I note that um, part of the reason that problems of knowledge um, how, you know, gain ground was because they've been entangled with ethics. And there was this idea that, um, and there's often a kind of smuggling that happens where certain knowledge claims are uh, invalidated on ethical grounds and certain ethical claims are invalidated on uh, epistemological or knowledge grounds. And I argued that, that that operation took hold in part because of, of, an, of a movement within humanities and social sciences, two parallel movements, let's say, um, uh, toward ethics as well. And those movements were uh, uh, initially both well-founded, good ideas, but that they produced a mess. And the first one was toward a kind of value neutrality. And this was promoted by sociologists, most famously Max Weber. Um, and he wanted to argue that um, you social sciences needed to be value neutral. And it was a good value in and of itself, but in certain fundamental ways, as I'll go into in a minute, it was 